Thank you so much. This is a huge honor for me to be a guest of uh, Sydney Institute. So a couple of words about myself. So um, I'm originally, my family originally from Poland and Ukraine. Uh, so the Holocaust survivors from Krakow and city of Lvov in Ukraine. So then during the Second World War, they, those who survived actually moved to Soviet Union. So I was born in city of Sverdlovsk, today is Yekaterinburg in Eastern Russia. So back to 1990, two months before the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, our family emigrated to Israel. So I live in Israel most of my life. So in Israel, I studied in a college, in university, and served three years in Israeli military. Um, half of my service I spent in uh, well-known Gaza Strip, <laughs> and another part in Lebanese border and West Bank. So this is another part of my background. And I studied business administration and law in Israel. And then I decided to, that is working in the office, it, at least for me, this is boring. I decided to travel the globe. So for now, I visited 152 countries. Um, so I, hopefully, hopefully, I want to get to 210. I think how many countries in the world. Um, and now back to my story. So one of the places I visited, uh, it was Artsakh, uh, Artsakh in Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh is more well known, um, his name. Uh, this is a small territory, mostly uh, Armenian Christian populated, but today it was depopulated because people just were expelled, and we'll get to this point. So at 2011, I traveled around Caucasus zone, including Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, just as a normal tourist. So I arrived to Yerevan, capital city of Armenia. I rented a car, so I traveled around like but most of the tourists. I spent two and a half days in Nagorno-Karabakh. I just took photos and videos around and met with local people, but my visit was really, really, really short, exceptionally short. So I went back to Armenia and so I left. And then I published a few articles in Europe and Israel and I believe a couple of articles in Russian media about my trip, but mostly about um, the heritage, I mean architectural and cultural heritage of this area. Um, about the people, about the food, like this, N nothing political basically, except of a couple of points. So of course I mentioned in brief the history of this region, uh, that Armenians lived there for I think close to a thousand years, uh, but during the Soviet times, I think in 1930 or 20, 1924, 25 I think, so the Armenian friends can just you know, correct me, uh, Stalin decided to surrender this territory to the uh, Azerbaijan Soviet Socialist Republic. But during the Soviet times, it's basically, it doesn't make sense because there weren't any real borders. It's more like states in Australia. So just administrative borders, just nothing. Uh, so people just could cross to, 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 from one republic to another. There were 15 republics in one state. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, after 1991, uh, all the administrative borders on the Soviet Union just were converted to real borders and sometimes just front lines. And same with Azerbaijan and Armenia. So this territory was the part, at least officially, it was the part of the Republic of Azerbaijan, I mean Artsakh. But inside, the population was for, I think, 95% Christian Armenian. And the most of Azer Azerbaijani population, they are Shia Muslims. So, uh, even before the collapse of the Soviet Union, I think in 1988, there were pogroms, massacre of Armenians in the city of Somgait in Baku, uh, where like half a million Armenians, ethnic Armenians lived, and hundreds of them were killed. I mean, it just happened during the Soviet times, even before the collapse of the, two years before the collapse of the Soviet Union. So many Armenians were killed and thousands wounded, and most of them just left Azerbaijan within a couple of years. So half a million Armenians actually left this country where they lived all their life. Um, part of them left to Russia, partly to the United States, Australia, Armenia, but part moved to Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, but then the Azerbaijani government I think it was the first government of independent Azerbaijan, they decided to, uh, to proceed for ethnic cleansing of the area, to, like, to expel all the Christian population out of Azerbaijan. 
So before the collapse of the Soviet Union, there were like 25% of the Azerbaijani population, Christians. Uh, I mean, Armenians, or Georgians, Russians, Germans, like different nations. So today, Azerbaijan is for 99.5% is Shia Muslim for today. Uh, I, I don't want to say anything against Muslims. I, I just want to mention facts. That, that, that's a point. Um, so um, it was the war. For, uh, Armenians called for that first Karabakh war in Karabakh. So the Armenian guerrilla fighters were able to, to win this war. And they kept this territory under their control. Um, and the territory, about 20% of total territory of the Republic of Azerbaijan. So this happened back to 1993. And then the Republic of Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, was actually established. Um, two and a half years ago, at 2020, um, Azerbaijani army assaulted uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh. Um, and within 44 days, they were able to occupy most of the territory. I would say like 75% of the territory held by Armenians. And 5,000 Armenian soldiers and civilians were killed. And tens of thousands wounded. And tens of thousands became refugees to Armenia. Refugees in a third time, actually, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and three months ago, in September, four months ago, at September 2023, Azerbaijan is actually um, attacked Artsakh one more time. And this time, we were able to occupy all of the territory. And then all of the Armenians were, have to leave this territory. So today, there are no Armenians at all in this territory. So today, is Azerbaijan is uh, Armenian free. It's more like, I remember the stories of my late grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor. He spent hell free in Auschwitz. So. Um, it was written on the, on the entry to Auschwitz, uh, Arbeit macht frei. And one more, one more point, German said, Judenfrei, so which means free of Jews. So uh, Azerbaijan is committed more or less the same genocide against Armenia. So today Azerbaijan is Armenian free. Um, and so back to my story. Uh, so 2011, as I mentioned, I visited this area. I published a few articles. So I continued my normal, normal life. After five years, in, two, in December 2016, um, during my trip from uh, Baltic states, from Lithuania, I think, to Russia, I think so, um, I had a stopover in Minsk, Minsk capital of Republic of Belarus. And in the middle of the night in my hotel, somebody knocked on the door. Um, so I just look in this hole in the door. I, I could see a masked policeman with Kalashnikov machine guns who told me open the door immediately. So I opened the door, I entered inside and said, you're under arrest in request of Republic of Azerbaijan. So I asked, how come? Is it a joke or something? <laughs> it's unbelievable. So they said, no, you can see the decision of uh, Prosecutor General of Republic Belarus. Here we have it. So we're going to arrest you. So just take your belongings, we are going to a police station. And then, um, so, so I knew very well what Belarus is. This is the last dictatorship in Europe, actually. And today, Belarus took a part in the war against Ukraine, together with Russia. So I, so I said, can I please go for a moment to the restroom? And I actually saved my life. They said, okay, go, but fast. I said, okay. So I entered inside. But unfortunately, when I took the shower before I went to bed, I forgot my cell phone in the restroom. So I was able to enter the room, uh, restroom and send the message to social media and emails uh, to my friends and to my wife that I'm under arrest because of my visit to uh, Artsakh five years ago. And then my cell phone made like bzz, bzz, so they could hear. They broke the door, entered it inside, they put me, uh, on the ground, and I remember that one of them major called somewhere and said in Russian, this bastard was able to send the message, so what to do now? So I think the original plan was just to take me from the hotel to the airport and bring me to unlawfully to Azerbaijan. It's just to kidnap, in a simple word, to kidnap me to Azerbaijan. Because uh, as I found find out m m much, much later, from one of my subscribers who work in uh, local Minsk International Airport, 
in a traffic control, and today he is a refugee in the United States. So he told on the very same day, um, the president jet, pre uh, Alif, president of Azam, his jet just arrived to the city of Minsk with uh, four armed people inside with machine guns, and were waiting for all the night long, and then left back to Azerbaijan without any passengers. So the plan was just to bring it to the airport and take me to uh, Azerbaijan. So I spent two days in a central police station of city of Minsk. Um, I was deprived of any visits, uh, so my wife tried to, to organize a meeting with my attorney. I was refused. I asked for the ambassador or somebody from Israeli embassy. I was refused as well. And Belarusian uh, police and investigators told me, uh, you, will, you will go to Azerbaijan. So this is the decision of our president. So just wait a couple of days. You're going, going, to be, to, 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 you're going to fly to Azerbaijan. So that's it. Uh, but um, and the next day, all the media in ex-Soviet Union and Europe and Israel already published that I'm under arrest in the Republic of Belarus. So they just couldn't just kidnap me to Azerbaijan. So I spent two months in uh, Belarusian jail. Uh, we tried our best to prevent my extradition. So I applied to the Belarusian court, central court of city of Minsk, but the court decided that they committed crimes against Azerbaijan, so uh, that they visited uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. So based on Azerbaijani law, this is a crime. And the second point, I called the president of Azerbaijan as dictator. So um, I insulted him. Based on the criminal code of the Republic of Azerbaijan, any insult of the president of his family is up to five years uh, sentence. Um, so finally, I was taken to Azerbaijan. So this aircraft arrived once again, the same one exactly, the same soldiers. So I was taken to uh, Baku. Uh, one day, actually not one day, on the same day when I was taken to Baku, I think a few hours before, it was a press conference of President Lukashenko of Belarus, and they could see this press conference because in our cell, it was just full of people. There were just like 30 people in a small small cell, like four meters on four meters, really small cell, and 30 people inside. So half of us were just sleeping on the ground. So and uh, my cell man just called me, come, come, you can see uh, the President of Belarus talking about you. And uh, President of Belarus was asked uh, by uh, some journalists, I think a Russian one or Armenian, I don't remember, uh, what about uh, Alexander Lapshin? So the President of Belarus, he didn't expect such a kind of question. He said, where is my Minister of Eternal Affairs? Uh, and one can find it in YouTube even today. And uh, just, uh, I, said, I told you, send him to Azerbaijan. I don't want you to, to, to answer these kind of questions. So it's really unbelievable. I could see this in my cell. So my cellmates, like local criminals, they told me, you are a miserable guy. You have something personal from our president. We are so much sorry about you. Be strong, they said. Uh, it was really horrible. So uh, his minister of eternal affairs said, just you know, by the way, so, uh, so Lapshin just applied to the high court of the Republic of Belarus. He's trying to prevent the extradition. So Lukashenko, president of Belarus, said, I don't, know, I don't care about the court. I am the president here. So send him to Azerbaijan. So on the same day, he was taken to Azerbaijan without any decision of the court. So I spent seven months in a solitary confinement in uh, Azerbaijani jail um, between cities of Baku and Sumgait. And this is very symbolic because uh, those two cities uh, had the biggest Armenian population before the massacre of uh, 1988. So the, the biggest jail of Azerbaijan is in the same place. Um, so from the beginning, Azerbaijani investigators um, told me uh, that I, I must confess, uh, uh, sorry, I must uh, plead guilty. I must plead guilty. And the second point, I have to say in the court that Karabakh is Azerbaijan. So I tried to explain them, look, I can say that Australia is part of Azerbaijan, but it doesn't make sense. This is just a joke. They said, no, this is because of our president. So this is kind of a gift to our Mr. President. So uh, pictures and different portraits of President Aliyev and his father is all, all around, everywhere, everywhere. So uh, I just bring interesting example. Uh, from time to time, I was invited to the 
office of uh, head of the jail. His name was Rashid Safarov, Colonel Rashid Safarov. And he has a huge office, really huge office. And when I was sitting in his office, um, I started to, just to count the portraits of Ilham Ali, of President Ali. There were, there were 44 portraits of President Ali, 44. And plus, two statues of Ilham Ali. So I asked him, uh, do you really need so many faces of your president? He said, sure. Uh, what was really interesting, uh, his deputy, deputy head of the jail, his name was uh, Yashar Magiramov. Uh, in his office, there are much less portraits of Ilham Aliyev, just 35. <laughs> yeah. um, this, this is a real dictatorship, more like North Korea or something. So I refused to cooperate with them. I said, I'm not the United Nations to decide on the future of this region. I'm not going to plead guilty because I'm not guilty. This is my job as a journalist to travel around the globe and to provide the information from different countries. And the second point, um, actually, uh, <laughs> so I said, what's going now in here, it's absolutely unlawful because uh, at the first month, I was deprived from my attorney, uh, from any meetings with my family members, um, any meetings with the Red Cross. So I was just alone. So all, all these conversations were just in front of Azerbaijan investigators. So I said, what, what you're asking from me to plead guilty and to say Karabakh is Azerbaijan? First of all, this is unlawful. And the second point, I don't want to talk without my attorney. So they said, look, you have two options. First of all, you'll be sexually raped. And the second option, you will cooperate with us. So just two options. In case you are going to cooperate with us, uh, we believe that our Mr. President uh, will just pardon you, will go home. So I'm not Ramba. Of course, I'm not Ramba. I said, okay, I'm ready to, to okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to, to say Azerbaijan is, uh, sorry, Karabakh is Azerbaijan, uh, Brazil is Azerbaijan, Canada is Azerbaijan, okay. So they said, this is not funny. So Karabakh is enough, they say. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's really, it, it sounds like a joke. This is a terrible joke, actually. And then during the judgment, I promised them to plead guilty and promised them to say Karabakh in Azerbaijan. But for some reason, I don't know why, when I arrived to the, to the courthouse, so I said, I'm not guilty. And Karabakh is not Azerbaijan. Uh, 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 not, not exactly. I said, I am not the one who goes to decide of the future of Karabakh because I am not Armenian, I am not Azerbaijani, I, am, I don't, don't work in the United Nations, so leave me alone, please. So then I received a sentence of three and a half years in prison. I was taken back to my solitary confinement, and a few days after, after the final judgment, I was assaulted in my cell by four masked men. So they promised I have two options or cooperate, or I will be beaten or raped. So I was assaulted for masked men. Uh, they entered inside in the middle of the night, and I had the light 24 hours per day in my cell. I didn't have any windows, but I have light 24 hours per day. They entered inside. I was sleeping, actually. I, I woke up because I felt I'm dying, because three of them kept my, my hands and my legs, and one of them just jumped with the, with the legs to my chest and started to strangle me like, this was the fingers. And then they put a pillow or something on my face so I, I couldn't see anything. So after about maybe 10, 15 seconds, I lost my consciousness. And I don't remember anything. So the next time I opened my eyes, this happened after four days in the intensive care unit of local hospital. Um, I had a broken hand, broken fingers, broken jaw, broken teeth. Uh, but the worst uh, was uh, I felt like I, I didn't feel the left part of my body, more or less, like, like, like after the stroke, because of the brain injury. I had a brain injury, like somewhere here. So for about half a year, I couldn't like walk normally. I could walk like, like uh, those people with stroke. Um, now I'm okay for 99%, thanks to God. <laughs> so. I was told by Azerbaijani um, officials who just came to my room in the um, hospital uh, that I tried to commit suicide, but they saved my life. And because of my good behavior, I received pardon from the president of Azerbaijan when I will be able to fly to Israel, I will be expelled to Israel. So they said, you are lucky. 
So uh, actually, my, my, my only question, I, I couldn't talk because I have broken broken jaw. So I have some of met metallic construction inside my, you know, here, to keep my, my jaw. I couldn't talk and I couldn't use my left hand, but I could write with my right hand. So I just asked the question, was I raped? <laughs> they said, no, you're lucky. <laughs> so I tried to keep a sense of humor. So then I was taken to Israel where I spent like two more weeks in Israeli hospital. And then I was released, and immediately I applied to European Court of Human Rights against the Republic of Azerbaijan. And on 20th of May 2021, I won the case, and Azerbaijan was found guilty by the European Court in illegal uh, arrest, torture, and attempt murder. And I was awarded with compensation, but Azerbaijan refused to comply with the decision, so refused to pay the compensation. I haven't received even one dollar. And then I applied to the Committee of Human Rights of the United Nations with the same complaint. And they won once again. Uh, so, and Azerbaijan was found guilty with the same things. And one very important sentence was in decision of European, uh, sorry, with the Committee of Human Rights of the United Nations, that any visit of any individual, any politician, any journalist to any disputed area, cannot be considered as a crime. So, any arrest, any ba there is no base for any arrest or extradition in that case. This is a very important point. Uh, so, for today. As already mentioned, in both cases, Azerbaijan refused to comply with the decisions, uh, haven't received any compensation. And basically, this shows this country, what Azerbaijan is. So country that, do not, that doesn't care about the decisions of the court and the United Nations. Um, so basically, this is my story in brief. So now we go to questions and discussions. So first of all, just tell us briefly what it's like to be in solitary confinement. Most of this room hasn't been there, you know. <laughs> Thanks to God. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then um, the connection with, I mean, you spoke about uh, Belarus, mm -hmm. and as you know, it's a close ally or controlled by Russia. So how do you see Russia's involvement in this? Just a couple of quick points, then we'll go to other questions. Oh. So uh, the first question about the solitary confinement. <laughs> So when I was in a Belarusian jail before the extradition, in a small room with a lot of people inside, with different criminals and different drug addicted, so I felt very unsafe and very uncomfortable. So I was just dreaming about to be alone. But when I, was, when I really spent seven months in a solitary confinement, this was a horrible experience. Because small cell, three on three meters, toilet is a hole, hole in the concrete, uh, water one time in the morning, one, uh, sorry, one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening, and no hot water at all. So once per seven or ten days I was taken to the shower for about five minutes, and then I have to wash my clothes. Uh, food is bad, really bad food, so in the morning uh, is a porridge. Uh, then water soup, so I, I created this, uh, this soup, water soup, <laughs> because there were just water, hot water, and small pieces of uh, cabbages and potatoes inside. I call for that water soup. So and in the evening, two options. Once again, porridge or mashed potatoes with the small parts of insects inside, which means meat. <laughs> um, so after about two or three months in such kind of conditions, so uh, uh, people just start to feel sick. So uh, normally, I, I feel OK. But after about two months in such conditions, plus two months in a Belarusian jail with the, with the same food, same conditions, so um, I felt different pains. Uh, I started to lose hair. I started to lose my teeth. Um, different um, skin, like uh, skin, not diseases, but different, you know. Um, and because I couldn't take a shower, to once again, I have a number of infections inside, so I had to, to deal with that after I was released in Israel. And all the people the same. So jail is a terrible place, actually. So when we think about the jail, we think about small cell, that's it. But that is not all. The worst punishment is, um, I, I haven't any television, no newspapers, no books, just nothing, and no windows. So for example, I, I didn't know what time it is. So, for example, if I received porridge, this means breakfast. Uh, water soup, 
means afternoon, more or less. So dinner means mashed potatoes. But from time to time, they change the food. So for example, I was sleeping, and they didn't have the watch. I was sleeping, and then they said, uh, dinner is coming. So how come? But I'm sleeping, so it's, I, I, I was thinking it's in the middle of the night. They said, no, 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 it's evening time. Take, take a mashed potatoes. So after about a couple of weeks of such a schedule, so I felt really bad emotionally and psychologically. So start to think about suicide. And this is kind of, kind of like a sickness. So I, I, I never had any uh, psychological depressions in my life. So I, I, all of us, I had bad mood from time to time. But I could not, um, I didn't have such experience of real psychological troubles. So I couldn't sleep normally. I couldn't stop thinking about suicide. This was like, I don't know. Like in the movie of, uh, you know, with Freddy Krueger. Do you remember this horror movie of Freddy Krueger? Uh, this horror movie from childhood. So I, I couldn't sleep. When I was sleeping, I had horrible dreams. And then I could hear that other cell, not cellmates, but other prisoners of different cells, they were just uh, screaming, Allah Akbar, we will kill you, we will find your family. Uh, so prison is bad. Um, avoid it, <laughs> if possible. Um, so uh, I was surprised, but Russian Federation actually opposed my extradition from Belarus to Azerbaijan, in spite of the fact that both Russia and Belarus, this is the same organization, means Commonwealth of the uh, Independent States, yeah. Uh, but based on the constitution of Russia and Belarus, they have the common constitution, um, they were prohibited to extradite Russian citizens from Belarus or Russia to the third country. So when uh, look, President Lukashenko uh, decided to extradite me to Azerbaijan, it's kind of a slap on the face of Putin. So Russia supported me not because of my personality, but because of this move of uh, President uh, Lukashenko of Belarus. So uh, Putin himself told in press conference to call for my immediate release, and Prime Minister, uh, sorry, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs uh, Lavrov said the same. And I couldn't believe this because all of my life I criticized Putin regime. I think it was the first, I thought it was the first who actually received such a kind of support from Russian Federation. And I feel on one side I feel confused, really confused because uh, we left Russia and uh, not not for, for fun, because we didn't like it. <laughs> and now they supported me. And Israel, and Israeli side actually, in my own opinion, maybe I'm mistaken, they just did nothing. Thank you. Were you still a Russian citizen when Putin was defending you? And the second issue is, how do you see the conflict between Armenia and Ar 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 Azerbaijan now? Uh, after ethnic cleansing of Nagorno-Karabakh, is it finished or we expect further war there? Uh, first of all, um, when we left Soviet Union, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, so Russia, as an independent state, was declared on 1991, I think. So a few months before we immigrated. So in 1992 or 93, I applied to Russian embassy in Tel Aviv. Um, and I received one more time Rus Russian citizenship, based on my uh, birth certificate. So then it was something different. So the president of Russia was uh, then Gorbachev, then Boris Yeltsin. So it was... Um, Russian democracy, so all of us believed in new Russia. But unfortunately, after coming of Putin, everything has changed. So I kept my Russian passport. So even today, so I said to myself, my, my, many, many friends of mine, especially those who live abroad in States, on Israel, elsewhere, they just uh, abandoned the uh, Russian passport. So I said, never. So I was born in that country. Um, so Putin regime will not last for long. 
So, so Turgenev and Pushkin, all those people, they're not guilty because of this regime. And the same, I have a number of friends of, from Iran who kept the Iranian passport. They said the Ayatollah regime will end sometime, and we're still Iranians. So I feel the same. So I criticized Russia, I criticized Putin, but I will keep my Russian passport, why not? I have an Ukrainian passport as well, because my family are originally from Ukraine. And both countries in war now. Yeah. No, of course this is this not end. It will continue, of course, this will continue because um Yeah, yeah, I think we'll continue because um, to, uh, totalitarian Azerbaijani government, they need kind of excuse to continue the, um, the dictatorship. So they used the Armenian issue as a basement for, for corruption, for illegal keeping this regime in power. So I think a week ago, there were elections in Azerbaijan and President Alif won the election, he received I think 93.9% of the people voted for him. So it's more like uh, Kim Jong-un in North Korea. Kim, Kim Jong-un, yeah, Kim Jong-un in North Korea. And this is really funny. No. There's a question down the back. Can you pass that along? Thank you. Uh, we were in the Caucasus in about 2017, 2018. And we were in Azerbaijan and we had a tour and the tour guide gave us at least 20 to 30 minute lecture on the genocide of the Azeris by the Armenians. Could you comment on that please? Oh, I know such a kind of stories. Um, when I was in prison in Azerbaijan, I've heard a lot of such kind of stories. For example, I was told by the Azerbaijani investigators that there is no such a nation, Armenians, not at all. So. Uh, this is gypsy tribes who came from India, <laughs> from city of Hyderabad in India. So I ask, why Hyderabad? Well, not from Delhi or Mumbai, why Hyderabad? They said, because Hai, Hai means Armenian in Armenian language, Hai. So I said, no way. I I am, and I visited India many times. I said, no, you're wrong, guys. Because Hyderabad, it's the name of saint in Islam, Haidar. Not because of Hai, but Haidar. So I said, you, you, you say that you are Shia Muslims, how come? Have you ever read Quran? That's unbelievable. So I heard different horrible stories that in a, city, um, a small village of Hojali, Armenians killed like tens of thousands innocent Azerbaijanis. And furthermore, one of them said, the Armenian soldiers just uh, opened the stomach of impregnant women and ate the um, children inside. So I said, have, have you seen this? He said, no, but my friend, uh, could you bring your friend? I want to talk to him. No, he already did. Um, so different, really, if, this is even not a joke. This is, it's more like my grandfather, my grandfather told me about um, the German Nazis, what they told about Jews, more or less the same. The Jews prepared the kosher food from the blood of Christians. So more or less the same I've heard about Armenians. So uh, more or less the same stories. Yeah. Uh -huh. So tell us about yourself. You seem to travel the world arguing with people. <laughs> <laughs> you must be very courageous or very stupid, <laughs> or both. So that's what you do. I mean, you can easily say nothing and get away. Uh, I cannot get away because this is my life. So uh, I never expected to fight with the Republic of Azerbaijan because I have nothing to, have nothing to do with both Armenia and Azerbaijan. I never lived. I have no rel relative in both countries. It's more like for you, just imagine you have to fight with Zimbabwe. With Zimbabwe. Why Zimbabwe? So the, the same for me, but I just can't stop because it's the question of uh, personal beliefs and the second human rights. And now I have a lot of friends of mine, of Armenian origin, who were killed in the war, 44 days war in Nagorno-Karabakh, were killed. And I am persecuted myself by Azerbaijan, so I cannot just stop it. Even I stop it, they will not stop to prosecute me. So I'm trying to keep uh, my publicity on a high level, because my publicity is my safety. Yeah. 
So, if I'm, oh, hang on, what, here we go. Yes, um, as a journalist, someone who's been to Azerbaijan and Armenia, why, why do you think there was complete and absolute silence about what was happening in Azerbaijan for about 10 months when it was under blockade, not even medicine could go in, and afterwards with the ethnic cleansing, there was hardly anything in the media. What do you ascribe it to? Uh, there's a very simple word, uh, cover of diplomacy. I mean, bribes. So Azerbaijan is invested billions of US dollars for bribing European and American officials. I believe in Australia as well. I can bring my own examples. So I come to Europe um, at, at least twice a month. I fly to Europe for different events and interviews and events. So at least half of my events, half of my interviews were canceled in the very last moment because of the bribes. So the last time this happened exactly one month ago. So I, I, I had to fly to Brussels in Belgium and to talk to the, I will not mention this, uh, this media, but one of the biggest media in Belgium. And we agreed on the interview and actually I appeared in the interview and I told, I story, I told all the story of Nagorno-Karabakh and blockade, etc., etc. And then they canceled. And after about two weeks, I received the message from one of the journalists. He said, I'm so much sorry but our editor-in-chief received like 20,000 euros. Support, support, this is not a bribe. This is grant, grant from Azerbaijani, uh, Hidar Ali Foundation. But it, he was asked to cancel this interview and uh, not upload it. That's it. Uh, do you think there was anything that Armenia should have done or could have done in terms of getting its story out into the media, and was there any failure on their part? I know it's a controversial question. <laughs> oh, this is very controversial because there are two points of view. Um, the first one, Armenia, unfortunately, very poor and weak country, at least for today. So there is no chance to, to win the war once again with Azerbaijan, because then the first Karabakh war was different. So Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan was established the year before, so it was a house around, so they were able to win, but not today, because Azerbaijan is um, purchased for tens of billions of dollars in Israeli and European and Russian weapons, and Azerbaijan is like five times bigger than Armenia, and no chance, basically. And another side of the question is that Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh, based on the international law, Unfortunately, this is part of Azerbaijan. So when I talk with Armenian officials, I ask them many times. So otherwise we know that this is ancient Armenian territory, but how come that for 30 years you haven't been able to recognize this territory as a part of Armenia or as an independent state? How come? So you ask the international community to recognize the independence of Artsakh, but yourself refuse to recognize the independence. So I, br I brought the example of Israel. So I do not support Israel in many fields, in spite of the fact I spent three years in Israeli military, in uh, occupied territories. So, but still, Israel declared Jerusalem as a part of Israel. And after 60, 60 years, after the uh, Second Day War, the United States decided to recognize Jerusalem as a part of Israel. And the same with Golan Heights occupied from Syria. So if Armenia was able from the beginning to, to call this territory as integral part of Armenia, it could be different. But once again, we cannot compare, you know, the resources of Armenia and Azerbaijan. There's a question there. Naomi. Uh, what do you think was the motivation of Lukashenko to support the expedition? Money. Money. Uh, this is for sure. Because. Um, hmm? uh, because uh, about my extradition. So, so why Lukashenko decided to extradite me to Azerbaijan? Just money. So after I was released, I received a lot of information from different, different sources from Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs, from Armenian diplomats, uh, from um, ex 
ex-Russian um, intelligence officers who now live in Europe. And today, I know for sure, Lukashenko have to pay the debt for a Russian company called Gazprom, that's the bigger supplier of petrol and gas, biggest Russian supplier of petrol and gas, um, the debt of $2 billion. So he was looking for, for some ways to go around. And then the, he has uh, received a warrant for my arrest. So in his opinion, it was a good way to try to, to do something with this debt of Gazprom. So my price is $2 billion. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm jo joking, joking. Uh, the situation was a little bit different, a little bit different. So in his press conference, uh, I believe it should be this translation to English, but at least in Russian, Lukashenko openly said in press conference, uh, he didn't talk about two million billion dollars, but he said, I try to talk with Israelis, Russian and Azerbaijanis, and they said, I have a little bit troubles in our economy, so please decide what to do with this guy? It sounds controversial. And then I talked with ex-Russian ambassador to Minsk, who two days he is just retired, and he told me about $2 billion. So Azerbaijan was able to provide credit for $2 billion against me. I'm not sure the Belarusians paid this credit, I'm not sure, but at least they received this. So what's with um, Armenia? I mean, we know about 1915 and the genocide, and now is, is, uh, is Armenia's problem that it's small and Christian, essentially, in a, I think it's Orthodox, isn't it? Uh, Orthodox Christian, um, surrounded by people who don't like it much. I mean, is that it? Yeah. Um, ah, sorry. The question about Georgia. The, the Republic of Georgia? Yes. Uh, Republic of Georgia, they have a very good strategic position. So they, um, both Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan dependent on Georgia because the pipeline Baku, Tbilisi, Jihan, which brings the petrol and gas from, from Russia, from Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, goes through Georgian territory to Turkey. Ah, by the way, um, I have to mention a very important point. Today, we have the war in Ukraine, but Azerbaijan took a part in this war because Russians just go around the sanctions and they bypass the sanctions by using this pipeline, Baku, Tbilisi, Jihan. So Russian petrol goes to Baku and then to Turkey. And Europeans just uh, play the game, so they didn't know. There are a lot of sanctions against Russian Federation, but no sanctions against Azerbaijan. So like 80% of Russian petrol goes through Azerbaijan. Their own sanctions, and that into you, into the forces um, invading Ukraine, right? Yes. So Azerbaijan's a big player in this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now we're getting to the end. Does anyone else? Um, yes. There's Naomi. Thank you. Um, just. Answer. Um, a question, and you mentioned. You, I think I had the impression you didn't. You did receive little support from Israel. Yeah, yeah, very little support. I would say no support, because um, from the beginning, when I was first allowed to meet with Israeli diplomat, it was Consul General of Israel to Azerbaijan. This happened, I think, after two months <coughs> after I was a president in Azerbaijan after the expedition, and she said. Um, First of all, I'm so much sorry about your story. And the second point, she said, you are a troublemaker because Azerbaijan is our ally. Uh, she said, I, I just search around uh, about you know, all your articles. So, so you mentioned yourself that you have troubles with Iran. So we need Azerbaijani territory in case of the war with Iran. So you yourself, you published that a lot of Israeli intelligence working Azerbaijan against Iran. She said, everything is true. So today, you're here in Azerbaijani jail. Why? Because you support Armenians. She said, what, 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 don't you have enough troubles with Palestinian case? Why do you need Karabakh? So she said, you're in a trouble. Because she said, well, we cannot just openly support you. Because we need them. I mean, Azerbaijanis, we need them. We cannot just 
ruin our relations with Ilham Aliyev. She said, I know, I know very well this is dictatorship, but we don't care. We have problem with Iran. So she said, of course, we will try different, way, uh, different ways to, to, to take you home, but she said, do not expect too much effort from our side. And when I was pardoned and taken to expelled, I sorry, expelled to Israel. So Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs, they didn't know. So after about four days, I was already in Israeli hospital. Israeli Foreign Minister commented that they just in the middle of procedures of my uh, extradition back to Israel. So Israeli journalist said, but he's already here for days. She said, oh, perfect, so huge success. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one more point. So my family, my wife, originally from the Republic of Moldova. Uh, so uh, when I was under arrest, I was in the middle of naturalization procedure in order to get Israeli citizenship. So because I was arrested, um, it was uh, stopped in the middle. Uh, she had to come to immigration authorities with our daughter, who then she was two years old, and our daughter, she is Israeli citizen, she was born in Israel. But my wife was said by the officer, immigration officer, he said, where is your husband? He said, in Azerbaijani jail. And he showed the newspapers. You can see his picture. It's all of the Israeli newspapers. Uh, he said, I know. I know this face. But I don't care. He said, based on the rules, you have to come together. I don't care about crimes of your husband. I don't care. And she was given 30 days to leave the country. Uh, together with our daughter, who is Israeli citizen. So both of them were expelled from Israel. This is really unbelievable. Uh, could you believe that Australian citizen can be expelled from Australia? And child, two years old. So w I didn't know about that. So when I was released and I spent some time in a hospital in Israel, I was able to communicate with the attorneys. So we canceled this decision of immigration authorities through the court. And she was able to come back with our daughter. And then I was invited to Israeli uh, more or less can. Uh, intelligence, Shin Bet, calls Israel Shin Bet, Israel intelligence, and they told me, um, we have friendly advice. Please stop everything you do against Azerbaijan, because this is against our national interest. They said uh, both Armenians and Russians and who else, they have their own interest. And we're the only country who actually supported you. I said, I don't believe you guys. You didn't support me. So they said, uh, we heard a little bit that your wife experienced some troubles with citizenship or something? I said, yes, I believe because of you. They said, uh, uh, they said, uh, depends on you. If you are going to stop it, just try to apply once again for Israeli passport and maybe she will receive her passport, maybe. Try your, try your luck. And basically I said, no way. I already applied to the European court. I will not stop. I said, I spent nine months in jail, I was almost killed, and now you're trying to blackmail me or something with the passport. Don't care about the Israeli passport. They will survive without the Israeli passport. There are too many countries in the world much better. So just leave me alone. So I won the case in the European Court, in the United Nations, and my wife still without Israeli passport, without work permit, without uh, health insurance. Uh, so, but we'll continue our life. But, I mean, as you know, Israel doesn't have many friends, so they're trying to survive too. Can I just wind up with uh, just a brief reflection? I know you, you're mainly a travel writer. Yeah. You get into a lot of trouble. Um, but as someone who was born in Ukraine when it was part of the old Soviet Union and someone who was a Russian citizen, how do you see what's going on in that part of the world, briefly? Apart from the food. Uh, you mean uh, Russia and Ukraine? Yeah. Um, at least for me, this is terrible because I have both passports, first of all, uh, parts of my family in both countries, in Ukraine and Russia, and few of my family members actually soldiers in the, this war on both sides, and all of them on my WhatsApp. This is unbelievable. In my WhatsApp, WhatsApp publication, WhatsApp publication. So, so once we were just one family, and after the war started, something happened. So family was absolutely destroyed. So people do not communicate with each other. So part of my family who live in Russia, I am talking about Jews. They are not Russians or Ukrainians, Jews. And they support Putin. And those who live in Ukraine support Ukraine, of course. 
And I'm the only one who tried to connect between them because this is crazy. Uh, so hopefully uh, the war will end sometime. But because of Azerbaijan, back to Azerbaijan, and because of Baku Belisi Jihan pipeline, it's going to take years. Many thanks. Thank you so much. Oh, many thanks to Alexander Lepskin, who's a very brave man and a controversial one. So he had some good uh, stories to tell us tonight in, in a very important area of the world. And um, those of us at the Sydney Institute, Anne and myself and others, have always had a lot of interest in Armenia, and uh, we heard from that tonight. So I also, also should say thanks to the um, Armenian National Committee of Australia for making this possible, and well done to our speaker, and good luck. Thank you.